chapter. Gospel of John, chapter 6. After these things. Now, in the other Gospels, we come to know what these things are. For the feeding of the 5,000 miraculously with the five loaves and the two fish are about the only miracle of Jesus that is mentioned in all four of the Gospels. And in the other three Gospels, we are told that it happened shortly after Herod had put John the Baptist to death. And the 70 were sent out to minister. They came back rejoicing over the miracles that they saw. Even the devils were subject to them. And uh, right after that, they had come back. Uh, the crowds were assembling. Uh, they were not giving Jesus really opportunity to rest very much. And so they went in the little ship over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, from the death of John the Baptist to the transfiguration of Jesus Christ was an approximate two-year period of time. It's the middle portion of the ministry of Jesus going from the death of John the Baptist to his transfiguration. That whole two-year period of the ministry of Jesus is recorded by John in this one short, well, it's a long chapter, but in the sixth chapter, uh, he covers a two-year period of time. Now, you remember that John tells us that he is not actually trying to give a full accounting of the life of Jesus. But he is selecting certain things from the life of Christ. Many other things, John said, Jesus did. But these things are written. I've selected from all of the things that Jesus did. And, and he did confess at the end of the book, I suppose, if, if, if we wrote everything that Jesus did, uh, that there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain them. But these things have I written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and by believing have life in his name. So John is telling us that he is not telling you everything. In fact, more is untold than what is told. But John is just selecting certain things out of the life and the ministry of Jesus to present in this gospel in order to prove to you that Jesus was the Messiah. So that by your believing in that, you might have eternal life. So in the two years of the ministry of Jesus, which the other Gospels tell us quite a bit about, John picks just three things. Two of them are the miracles of Jesus, two miracles, and then the resultant talk that came out of the miracles that Jesus performed. The, miracles of, uh, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 with the, uh, or 5,000 plus, with the five loaves and two fish, and his walking upon the water. These are the two events. And then the discussion that comes out of this are the things that John chooses out of this two-year period of the ministry of Christ to relate to you in order to bolster his whole thesis that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of 
Tiberius. Uh, John gives us a very abbreviated account of even the feeding of the 5,000. You have to more or less put uh, the other Gospels together to uh, get the full impact of this miracle and of the story. Um, the other Gospels fill us in on many of the details. Uh, it is John's Gospel that tells us that it happened right after, I mean Matthew's Gospel tells us it happened right after the death of uh, John the Baptist, as does Mark's Gospel. Luke places it right after the 70 disciples uh, returned with the glowing reports of the healings and the devils being subject. Mark also mentions that they had just returned. Uh, and so Mark ties the two events together, the death of, Herald, of Herod with the return of the disciples. We read a great multitude followed him. Now, in the Greek language here, uh, the tenses are a little different than what they turned out here in the English. Let me read it to you with a more accurate uh, rending of the uh, Greek text. Uh, the great multitudes were following him because they were seeing his miracles which he was doing on them that were diseased. In other words, it is a present perfect kind of a they continued to follow him because they were watching, continually seeing the many miracles that he was doing. Uh, at this time in the ministry of Jesus, he was performing many miracles. And the miracles drew a great crowd of people. And there is a fascination uh, in seeing a miracle. And people were being drawn out of curiosity, out of fascination. And they were following him. Great multitudes were following him. Um, Mark's gospel tells us that it was so bad that they didn't even have time to eat. Uh, the pressure upon them was so great. People were there just continually, all day long, from early morning till uh, in the evening, after dark, uh, just pressuring, pushing, seeking more, bringing their sick. And uh, it was something that was just uh, pressing on them until they were weary. They had just become weary with, with all of the continued pressures uh, that were surrounding them at this particular uh, part of the ministry. And so Jesus suggested that they go over to the other side of the lake to a deserted area that was near Bethsaida. Now, don't, don't read that desert area. It is not desert. It is deserted area. Uh, and it was an area that uh, there are fewer villages on the far side and uh, more or less a deserted area, and it was near the village of Bethsaida, between Bethsaida and uh, Gadara, uh, that he went with his uh, disciples. And um, the other Gospels tell us that the people saw the direction that the little ship was going, and so they ran around uh, the upper part of the lake uh, and met the boat when it landed on the other side. Uh, Jesus, first of all, went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Jesus took upon himself the limitations of a human body. And in the limitations of the human body, he experienced 
weariness. He experienced tiredness. Just as we experience weariness and tiredness. In the book of Hebrews, it tells us that it was important that the high priest be taken from among men so that he could have sympathy and understanding for man. And thus our great high priest taking on the human body, the form, uh, is able to understand our weaknesses and thus uh, help and minister to us when we are experiencing weaknesses. He can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, the book of Hebrews says. And, and such a great high priest we have. And, and that's part of the purpose of the incarnation, that he might experience the same kind of fatigue that we experience, the same kind of weariness that we experience, so that he can help us and minister to us now in our weariness, in our fatigue, when we are pressured, when we are tired, when we feel I've got to get away. He understands that. He understands that fully. He, he had that feeling at this time. You remember when he and the disciples were coming from Jerusalem, passing through Samaria, they had come to the uh, Jacob's well near Shechem, and Jesus, being weary, stayed there at the well while the disciples went into town to buy meat. Um, in a human body, he experienced the same things that we experience in the human body, the same kind of physical things that we experience, he experienced, and thus he understands. He is able thus to help us uh, to be touched, to be, uh, have sympathy or empathy for us in our weaknesses and in our weariness. Now, we are told in the other Gospels that Jesus seeing this great multitude, the great company that were coming, began to minister to them of the truths concerning the kingdom of God. The world was weary of war. It was weary of politics. It was weary of crime, weary of sin, weary of subjection. And Jesus talked to them of the glorious future, a day that would come when God would establish his kingdom upon the earth when the earth would be as God intended it to be. A time when they would beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. A time when they would study war no more. A time when there would be no sickness. He was healing all of the sick but there will come a day when there will be no sickness. All will be well and healthy. No physical infirmities. And he was talking to them of that glorious kingdom age of which Isaiah wrote, of which Jeremiah wrote, and the other prophets looking ahead wrote of the glorious kingdom age. An age in which there would be no commerce, no exploiting of others. The whole resources of the earth are to be freely used by all according to their needs. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye, come and eat. 
Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and all? And Isaiah goes on to talk about this kingdom age and, and how glorious it will be. Jesus continued to encourage them, laying out the hope for the future. God's glorious day that is going to come. That day in which God will provide for the physical needs, for the food and so forth, and um, the day without commerce. So Jesus was talking to them of these glorious things. But then he said to Philip, and we are told by the other disciples, it was getting towards the evening. He had spent the whole day ministering to the people. Now towards the evening, Jesus said to Philip, Where can we buy bread that all of these may eat? Now, the reason why he asked Philip probably is because Philip was from Bethsaida. Hey, Philip, this is your hometown. Uh, you, know the, you know the area around here. Where can we buy bread that all of these may eat? Now, Jesus also knew that the suggestion of buying bread to feed the multitude was ludicrous. Going into the little family bakery in Bethsaida and saying we want a thousand loaves of whole wheat bread. Uh, you know, in other words, Jesus was aware that um, it, it wasn't possible to purchase bread. And, and, and Philip was sort of stunned by the question. The, the disciples were all saying, Lord, send them away. You know, it's getting late. Send them away. Get them out of here, Lord. And, you know, send them home. And Jesus said, no, I, you know, they've been with me all day. And if you send them home without eating, they'd probably be faint. We better feed them. And Philip, uh, where can we buy enough bread to feed these people? And Philip said, Lord, uh, if, we, if we bought 200 penny worth of bread, it wouldn't be enough to feed them. Now, a, a penny was a denarius, uh, which was the, uh, about $25 equivalent to um, our money today. So 200 times $25, or uh, about a half a year's uh, wages for a laboring man. Lord, if we had 200 any worth of bread, it, it, we, we couldn't be, feed these people. Now, John tells us that Jesus was only asking the question to prove him, to test him. For John tells us that Jesus knew what he was going to do. I find that rather interesting that Jesus would purposely toss at Philip a question that would raise problems in Philip's mind. A question that would test him. Because Jesus all along knew what he was going to do. But by giving the problem to Philip, it, it threw him. Now, Jesus said, where can we buy bread? And he didn't even answer where. He just said, hey, you know, we don't have the money. If we had 200 penny worth of bread, it, it wouldn't be enough to feed these people. And so uh, Philip was, was probably all shook over this thing. And I'm sure Jesus was just smiling as, as Philip was getting all upset, you know, thinking, oh, what can we do, what, you know, and, and, and where will we go? But the whole while, Jesus knew what he was going to do. Jesus was always the master of every situation. You need to remember that. When you're faced with some of those difficult problems and you just don't know what you're going to do, Remember, 
He's the master of every situation. When the tax collectors were bugging Jesus and Peter as they were coming into Capernaum and seeking customs taxes, well, they were from Capernaum and thus they were free of taxes. And yet, as tax collectors are, uh, they don't always care um, necessarily just if they can pressure and get an extra buck there willing to do so. And thus, they were pushing Peter and Jesus, and, and Jesus said, probably in the hearing of the fellow, so that the fellow knew that they knew the law, Jesus said, do they collect the taxes, the custom taxes, from uh, strangers or from the citizens? And Peter said, well, from the strangers. And he said, then the citizens are free. They don't have to pay tax, do they? Peter said, no. And Jesus said, well, so this guy doesn't get all bugged. Go down and catch a fish and take the coin out of the mouth and pay him, you know. Uh, but Jesus, again, sort of testing Peter, you know, asking the questions about taxes and all. And uh, Jesus always knew what he was going to do. He was always the master of every situation. But sometimes I think he lets us stew over the situations to show us how worthless stewing is. You know, all of our figuring, all of our, well, 200 penny worth, of, you know, and all of this stuff that we go through is totally unnecessary because Jesus knows all along what he's going to do and he's got it all worked out and it's all figured out and he's going to take care of it. But if you are the kind that just like to stew over it, he'll let you stew over it. But oh, what needless pain we bear because we don't realize the Lord's in control. The Lord's going to take care of it. The Lord is on the throne. He's the master of every situation. And, and he wants you to understand that and know that so that you will just relax and rest and say, well, the Lord will take care of it. Now, when you get to that point, you're going to drive your friend's buggy. <laughs> They'll have a hard time handling you when you're not all worried anymore, not all upset anymore, you know. And when you get to that place, you say, well, the Lord's going to take care of it, you know. Well, Don't you know that you've got to have it by next week? Well, yeah, the Lord knows that we have to have it by next week. I mean, and he's going to take care of it, you know. But you're not being practical. Well, the Lord knew what he was going to do. And I like that. I like that very much. The Lord knew what he was going to do. But he let Philip worry about it for a little bit to make him realize that worrying doesn't do anything. John tells us that it was close to the feast of the Passover, verse 4. It, it was, and the Passover, he said, a feast of the Jews. Now, this is another one of those what they call internal evidences that John was not writing to Jews. Whenever he uses Hebrew words, he translates them into Greek for the readers. Whenever he speaks of Jewish holidays like this, he explains, to, uh, he speaks of the Passover and then he explains to them, that's one of the Jews' feast. And so in writing the story and giving the time of the year, it was near Passover, so we know it was in the spring time of the year. Uh, we are told that there was a lot of grass there. And if you go today to the area of Bethsaida, uh, it's just nothing but ruins today. There's, there's no real evidence of the city there anymore. Uh, it was one of those cities that came under the curse of Jesus, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. These were the three cities that Jesus cursed. And interestingly enough, these 
are just ruins today. They have uncovered a part of Capernaum. They have recently uncovered uh, quite a bit of Koreaism. They have not yet done any excavating in the area of Bethsaida, but uh, these cities cursed by Jesus are nothing but ruins today. Uh, but in the area of Bethsaida, it's on the upper shores of the uh, Sea of Galilee, extremely beautiful, and in the springtime, covered with grass. And so John's uh, little comment for there was much grass in that place. Uh, if you've ever been there in the springtime, you, you, can, you can know the accuracy of, of uh, the statement. So Jesus told the disciples to have them sit down. Uh, in another gospel, it says in uh, sections of 50. And um, Andrew, uh, getting back though to, to Philip, where are we going to buy the bread? Andrew chimed in. Philip was, was flustered by the whole thing, so Andrew chimed in and he said, well, there's a, there's a little lad here who has five loaves and two little fish. And then having said it, he probably thought how ridiculous that must sound. <laughs> here are 5,000 men plus women and children and so you probably have at least 10,000 people, perhaps as many as 15,000 there, because this little boy probably wasn't the only child that was there. And so he said, there's a small lad, and it's in the diminutive uh, in Greek, and the word lad and fish are both diminutive. And thus it's a little boy, and the fish are little. <laughs> He has five loaves and two tiny fish, uh, probably the sardines uh, that were uh, very common. The, 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 the Sea of Galilee has a special sardine that they uh, used to pickle, and uh, it was a delicacy throughout the world, the pickled sardines from the Sea of Galilee. And, and even to the present day, the sardines in the Sea of Galilee are considered a great delicacy. And, and so uh, he has five loaves and two little fish. <laughs> but what is that, you know, <laughs> among so many people? I mean, having said it, then he realizes just how foolish that must have sounded. So he immediately passes it off and says, but, you know, what's that among so many people? Andrew is an interesting person, the brother of Peter, and uh, of a different temperament and all from Peter. Uh, Andrew has the reputation of being the one who was always bringing others to Jesus. Uh, it was Andrew who first followed Jesus. He was a disciple of John the Baptist. Jesus, John said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew began to follow Jesus. And uh, when he realized that Jesus indeed was the Messiah, he went and got his brother Peter. And Andrew was bringing people to Jesus. And so Andrew brought the little lad to Jesus. We have a little boy here. Five loaves and two small fish. Bringing little children to Jesus. It's a very beautiful thought to me. When you bring a child to Jesus, you never know what the potential of that child is for the kingdom of God's sake. There was an old German school teacher 
who every day when he would come in to teach his class of boys, he would bow down before the boys. And one day he was questioned concerning this rather odd behavior. Why do you bow down before the boys, the little boys in your classroom? And he said, you never know what the future holds. And one of these little boys may grow up to be a leader. And one of those little boys in his class grew up to be Martin Luther. And so uh, you never know the potential of a child. And uh, bringing children to Jesus, you, you never know what the Lord will do through their lives. So Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish after having the men sit down and he gave thanks. And this is, of course, where we pick up our tradition of giving thanks for our meals sort of following the pattern that Jesus set. And the Jews had a special prayer for their bread. And uh, we thank thee, O Lord, heaven and earth, creator of all things, that you have given us the wheat and so forth and provided us with the bread. So um, Jesus gave thanks. It's, it's an interesting thing to note that they were barley loaves. Now, barley loaves was the bread for the poor people. Most generally, they ground the wheat and had wheat bread. But uh, the poor people could not afford the wheat, and they would make their bread out of barley. Barley was animal food. People usually didn't eat the barley. It was kept for animal fodder. And, and so um, under the law, if a woman, and uh, this seems like maybe a digression, but I'll, you'll see where it comes back. Uh, under the law, if a woman committed adultery, uh, she uh, and received back by her husband, she'd have to bring an offering to the Lord, the, the meal offering that they would make the little cakes out of, but she couldn't bring the wheat. She had to bring barley, signifying that she had acted like an animal in the committing of adultery and uh, because barley was used for animal feed. And so um, the fact that they were barley loaves... Um, is significant as far as uh, it uh, showed that the you know, little boy probably didn't have much. Uh, but he took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise the fish. And notice, as much as they wanted. Pass it out. Take as much as you want. He broke the loaves, the fish, gave it to the disciples to give to these people who were sitting in these companies of 50. And so, verse 12 tells us, when they were filled, the word filled there in Greek is glutted. You ever been glutted? You know, when you go to these smorgasbords, and, you know, all you can eat, you know, and, and this was the thing, you just pass out as much as they want. You know, give to them as much as they want. So uh, when they all ate and were glutted, filled, he said to his disciples, now gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and they filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. 
So a, a notable miracle indeed. Now, the significance of 12 baskets, I'll leave that with Chuck Missler to explain. Uh, from five loaves and two fish getting 12 baskets, I'm sure that he's got something interesting uh, with that number, but um, that's his department. Um, To me, it's just an awful lot, <laughs> you know, of, of, of remains from um, five loaves and two fish after 5,000 men had eaten and then were glutted. Uh, it uh, is indeed a notable miracle. Now, when those men had seen the miracle that Jesus did, they said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Seeing this, now you remember he was talking to them about the kingdom. What's going to happen in the kingdom age? There's going to be plenty for everybody. You're not going to have to buy. There'll be no buying or selling of food. It'll just be uh, plenty for everyone. And, and he had just been talking to them about the kingdom and about how things are going to be in the kingdom. And now he feeds them all until they're just, they're just so stuffed they can't eat anymore. And, and he did it with just the five loaves and the two fish. And so they immediately, upon seeing this miracle, being fed, being full, They said, surely this is the prophet that is supposed to come into the world. Now, that goes back to the prophecy of Moses, where Moses predicted that the Lord shall send to you another prophet like unto myself, and to him you shall give heed. So, the question oftentimes was asked, are you then that prophet? They asked that of John the Baptist when they were seeking to find out who he was. Who are you? Uh, are you the Messiah? No. Are, uh, you know, are you then that prophet? Uh, the one that was promised by Moses, God raising up another prophet like unto myself. To him you shall give heed. And so, uh, it was an acknowledgement here that this is the Messiah. This is the one that was promised by Moses, the prophet like unto Moses. And this is important because as we go on into the further dis discussions that is that are going to the discussions that are going to come out of this, Moses is going to be brought up and the manna in the wilderness, and it's going to be compared now with with what Jesus has done in, in giving them the bread. In a miraculous way, Moses providing the manna, uh, or God providing through Moses the manna in a miraculous way, and, and thus the tie-in of the two, and we'll get that as we get into the discussion that will follow this. And so it, it's, it's, it's significant that there is this tie now with Moses. Now today, the rabbis today, are telling the Jewish people that Jesus could not be the Messiah because Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And the rabbis are saying to the people, the Messiah will not be the Son of God. The Messiah is a man. Because Moses was a man, and if he is a prophet like unto Moses, he'll have to be a man. And thus, don't look for a divine son of God for your Messiah, but look for a man as your Messiah. And they are suggesting to them that the man who is their Messiah and the way they will, if he is a man, then how will he recognize or know him? And you'll know him by the fact that he will lead you in the rebuilding of the temple. 
And so the Jews, for the most part today, are looking for a man to come and to lead them in the project of the rebuilding of the temple. And by that, they will recognize him as the Messiah. Now Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name, and you did not receive me. There is another one who is coming in his own name, and him you will receive. That's in the last chapter that we just studied, uh, 543 of John. In the book of Daniel, chapter 9, as the angel speaks to Daniel about the 77s that are determined upon the nation of Israel, upon the holy city, upon the people of Israel, he speaks of the 69 sevens that would, it, that would transpire between the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah the Prince will be 69 sevens or 483 years. And we do know from the time the commandment went forth, 445 B.C. by Artaxerxes, to the coming of Jesus was 483 years. Now, that leaves the 70th, there are 77s determined upon the nation of Israel. That leaves the 70th seven-year period yet to be fulfilled. And at the end of chapter 9, Daniel tells us that the prince of the people that shall come, and uh, the people that were come were those that were going to destroy Jerusalem. The Messiah will be cut off. The people will be dispersed. And uh, the, the nation that, of course, destroyed Jer uh, Jerusalem and created the dispersion was Rome. And the prince of the people that shall come will make a covenant with the nation. But in the middle of that seven-year period, he will break the covenant. He will come to Jerusalem and cause the daily prayers to cease, the sacrifices, and will set up the abomination which will create the desolation. I believe that the covenant that the Antichrist will make with the Jews will be the covenant whereby he will present the solution so that they can rebuild their temple. And if the Jews today are looking for a man, not the Son of God, but just a man, to lead them in the rebuilding of the temple, surely when the Antichrist comes with that plan, and that covenant, that agreement, that treaty that will allow them to rebuild their temple, they, as Jesus said, will follow him. I came in my Father's name. You did not accept me. Isn't that interesting? He said, I am the Son of God. And now they're saying we don't accept him because he said he was the Son of God. Uh, there's another who will come in his own name. Him you will receive. So Jesus is, is declaring that the Jews will first of all receive the Antichrist. They will be deceived by him. And, uh, and it, it's to me an amazing thing how ready they are today to acknowledge any man who can lead them in the rebuilding of their temple as the Messiah. Now, that Jesus, or that the Messiah, was to be the Son of God is something that the Scriptures were very clear about. And in the time of Christ, the rabbis and all were expecting the Messiah to be the Son of God. When Peter said, Thou art the Messiah, he said, The Son of the living God for that was the common belief of that day. When the high priest was examining or cross-examining Jesus, he said, 
are you the Messiah? And when Jesus answered in the affirmative, he said, are you then the Son of God? Now, that was a question that would logically and naturally follow the confession of being the Messiah. You would have to say, yes, I am the Son of God, because they were expecting the Messiah to be the Son of God in those days. It's only more recently that they say, well, uh, you know, we don't believe that the Messiah is the Son of God. That's something that's relatively new. It surely did not, that was not the common belief of the rabbis and the Jews at the time of Christ. Prophesied in the Old Testament, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Who gave his son? The government will be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so uh, they were looking for the Messiah to be the Son of God in those days. No longer are they expecting the Messiah to be the Son of God. The rabbis have convinced them that he'll be a man like Moses. So when they had seen the miracle when they had eaten and were filled and they were sitting there stuffed, they said, this must be the prophet that Moses told us would come into the world of a truth. Surely this must be that prophet. And they were determined to force the kingdom to take Jesus and by force make him the king. They were ready to acclaim him there. Now, we'll get into this next week. Jesus would not allow them to force the issue on the basis of the miracles. And I think that that is extremely significant. We'll get into that next week. Uh, how that Jesus refused uh, to allow them to acclaim him as the king at this point on the basis of they had eaten the, the bread and were full. Uh, that's not the basis upon which you recognize the Messiah, not on physical things, uh, not on physical miracles. It has to be in the spiritual dimension that you recognize and that he reigns as the king of your life, not because of physical things, but because of spiritual. We'll get into that as we continue our study in John's Gospel next Thursday night. Father, we thank you For that recognition that we have today as the result of the work of the Holy Spirit within our lives, that Jesus indeed is the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world, and He is our Lord and our Master. And we bow our knee before him's throne. We yield and surrender our lives to his control. We kiss his scepter and pledge allegiance unto him as king and lord. And help us, Lord, to realize that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And thus, Lord, may our faith be established in the word and not in some miracle, some experience. Lord, may our faith be established in your eternal, immutable word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Shall we stand? When we get into the discussion that is going to follow this, it is interesting that as Jesus begins to give the spiritual applications to what they had seen, what they had experienced. You see, as they experienced the miracle and ate and were filled, they were ready to make him the Messiah. When he gets through talking about these issues, <laughs> they left. It was interesting. Jesus wasn't looking for the popular acclaim of the crowd in a moment of an emotional experience. At the end of this chapter, and many of the disciples went away and followed him no more. Because he starts getting into the spiritual aspects. You see, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy. It's a spiritual kingdom that we're looking forward to. And so, um, go ahead and read on. It is thoroughly permissible. <laughs> and uh, see how this led into discussions and it led into statements that were extremely difficult for them to accept. And some people today find it difficult still to accept. But to those who have received, Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation to those that believe. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now on behalf of the Word for Today, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith. We thank you for joining us in today's broadcast. For more of Pastor Chuck's studies and biblical teaching resources, visit our website at pastorchuck.org. You can contact the Word for Today at the Word for Today, P.O. Box 890-820, Temecula, California, 92589 or email us at infopastorchuck at gmail.com. We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study in our next broadcast with Pastor Chuck.